Realm presents Bullet Catcher, Season 3, Episode 9. Fear of Death. Len and I ride south along the water, far out of town, taking the creature with us. We come to a cove shrouded by huge boulders rising halfway out of the water, covered in bird shit and feathers. Huge gulls squawk and fill the air with gray feathers, floating on the water like small boats in a storm. The waves break against the rocks in explosions of water like confetti. I watch all these new sights with fascination as I unwrap the creature and make it a bed with the wrappings in the sand. And it watches the water and the birds, occasionally giggling. Len and I stand close to hear each other over the waves. When we met, you wanted to learn my way of bullet catching. Do you still want to learn? I do. Look at the water. It crashes over and over on the shore, and the shore seems unaffected. But over time, the water will bring down mountains and grind everything to sand. To catch bullets like me, you must learn to be like the water. Patient, slow, measured. How can being slow help me catch bullets? I have to be faster than the bullets. You don't need to react individually to every bullet. You waste energy in doing so. Instead, move your body like a wave. Let yourself crash over them. I gaze afar at the creature, who's now watching the birds float on the updraft like marionettes on strings. And what about the creature? How can I do any of this if all I can think about is failing? One thing at a time. For now, clear your mind. There is no child. There is only you, learning how to catch bullets again. Lena takes out the gun and walks down the beach. She turns and gives me the signal. I return it. She raises the gun and, in the blink of an eye, empties the chamber at me. Fear seizes me and I hit the ground. A moment later, I'm coughing up sand and Lena is offering me her hand. It's too much, too fast. No. Don't you see? The more they shoot, the easier it is. Next time, don't focus on a single bullet. Instead, think of every shot as part of the same one, and then use a single movement to deflect them into the sand. She turns and walks away before I can raise another objection. The sound of the waves crashing drowns out my mumbled protests. She turns and raises her hand. I draw a deep breath and hold it, get into first position, and give her the signal. She empties the chamber. The waves make the gun sound like a firework gone off far away. And I see it. The bullets like a single thing, a flash. I twist and bring my arm down across my body, feeling the mass of bullets like a cloud of flies, and I push them away, down into the sand at my feet. Lena comes over and digs the bullets out of the sand. Good, she says. You almost got them all. What? And then the pain hits. One of the bullets has caught me in the right arm. Blood runs off the tips of my fingers. There was a time I'd gotten used to this feeling. This sick, dull pain spreading through my body. Now it feels like the first time again, and I'm scared. I can't remember how I pushed the pain away enough to carry on. And maybe sensing that, Lena pulls out her kit, tears away the sleeve of my shirt, and begins the process of digging out the bullet and sewing up the wound. I sit there in the sand taking big gulps of air and holding the creature tight to my side. When I feel strong enough to walk, we begin our trek back to Half Moon. I sling the creature over my left shoulder, moving my smarting right arm as little as possible. We're not too far away when we hear the shooting. Staying low and using the boulders around the bay for cover, we edge our way closer to town, finally sneaking inside down a deserted boardwalk town seems nearly abandoned. Most of the townspeople have sealed themselves in their homes or businesses. The doors are locked, the shutters closed. Down at the end of the street, where it crosses with a pier leading out to the water, a band of gunslingers, armed to the hilt, runs by and disappears behind the inn. Out on the water, several small skiffs, loaded with more gunslingers, encircle the harbor. Now the shooting starts up again coming from the far end of town in the direction the gunslingers had been moving. 
At the risk of being seen, we abandon caution and make our way as quickly as possible toward the gunfire. We find Cass, Nico, the man in the cassock, and another older man, who must be Daniel, trapped between the gunslingers and the water on the north shore of town. At their backs, the gunslingers and the boats close in. Before them, a half circle of 15 or 20 more inch closer. Nico throws down his guns and the four of them raise their hands and surrender. Now what the hell are we going to do? I ask. We'll let them get captured. What? Between the gunslingers on the water and the ones on the shore, there's too many. And you're nursing a child and an injured arm. We're fighting on their terms. They're likely to take them to the fort to the north that the old man told us about. They'll have to split their forces, so if we hit them en route, our chances will be better. And what if they just decide to execute them here and now? Lena looks at me and pulls a funny expression. Well, that would be a problem, wouldn't it? We watch and wait, hidden behind the boulders as Cass, Nico, and the two older men are put in chains and led into an armored wagon. The gunslingers in the boat depart, and the wagon sets off on a slow trundle up the narrow path to the top of the cliff and out of town. We wait until the carriage disappears over the top of the pass, and for the gunslingers lingering in town to let down their guard. Then we head for the stables, quickly and quietly, saddle the horses, and start our pursuit. It doesn't take long to catch up with the armored wagon. The trail north follows the coastline. The winding path gives us plenty of time to head off the trail and pass the convoy, rejoining the road about a mile ahead, where the road dips below the coastline and continues along the side of the cliff, before rising back up a few hundred yards later. We hide the horses in an outcropping of trees, get low, and make our way to the cliffside. Down the way, the convoy reappears. It's led by two gunslingers on horseback, riding double file, and followed by a small posse of four more. Beside the driver, another two gunslingers ride atop the wagon, and there may be one or two more inside, guarding the prisoners. We wait as the caravan rolls closer. My heart beats loud in my temples. The creature wriggles against its wrapping, and suddenly, all I can think about is that feeling that I can't protect it. Maybe if Lobo hadn't died and I'd never stopped bullet catching, things would be different. I'd be stronger, wiser. But now all I can think about is how I can't protect the creature. I can't do this. Lena turns to me. What the hell do you mean you can't do this? I mean, I can't put the baby at risk. When I was in Gravesend, I thought I could protect it no matter what, but I don't think I can. Lena turns back to the wagon, trundling closer. We have only a minute. I can't do it without you, she says. My heart beats loud in my ears. How do you choose between your child and your family? Only seconds now. Retreating from the cliff edge, I return to the tree line, unwrap the creature, and find a spot for it hidden by a bush beneath one of the trees. I chance a look at Lena, behind me. She's rearing to jump onto the wagon. I turn and kiss the top of the creature's head. Don't move, I plead. Please, just don't move. It stares up at me with big eyes, its face ready to explode in sadness because it knows I'm going. I turn, just as Lena goes over the edge, and then I'm running as fast as I can back to the cliff edge, leap and land on the roof of the wagon. The impact sends me sprawling, rolling down the back of the sloped roof. Right as I'm about to fall off the edge, I manage to reach out and grab the lip. I dangle off the back, my legs waving in the air, trying to find purchase. Behind me, the gunslingers look on, too surprised at first to do anything. Then they snap out of it and draw their shooters. From above, Lena grabs me by the collar and lifts me up, back onto the roof, just as the gunslingers let off their first volley. We fall back on top of the wagon, making ourselves as flat as possible. Bullets whiz over our heads and nearly hit the driver. Hold your fire, he yells, struggling to keep the horses under control. A gunslinger leans her head out the window and shouts, What the hell is going on? We're under attack. Stay inside. One of the gunslingers up front calls back. The two riding up on top with the driver take aim at us over their shoulders. Watch out, I yell, and swipe at the bullets with one long sweep of my arm, swatting them away. That felt good. It felt easy. Easier, at least, than it had been lately. Two singe marks color the skin on my arm, bringing me back into my body. Lena picks herself up and dives for one of the shooters. As they tussle, the other gunslinger reaches across the driver, trying to untangle them and throw Lena off. 
He rears back to deliver a punch, but I catch him by the crook of his arm and throw him over my shoulder. He falls off the side of the wagon, hitting the wheel on the way down and disappearing under the horses trailing behind us. The gunslinger fighting with Lena pulls his gun. She grabs his wrist and twists until he lets go. The gun falls at the driver's feet. Lena drives her elbow into the gunslinger's chest, grabs him by the shirt, and throws him overboard. The driver begins reaching for the gun, but I grab him in a headlock and pull him back. He drops the shooter, and Lena picks it up and sticks the barrel under the driver's nose. Just keep driving, she says. The man swallows and keeps his eyes straight ahead. She tosses me the gun. Keep the ones behind us busy. One of the gunslingers riding ahead drops back alongside the wagon. She stands up on the saddle and leaps for the roof, grabbing hold of the lattice and using the window frame as a foothold, while the one up ahead provides covering fire. Lena swats away the shots with yawning sweeps of her arms. When I try to climb back on top of the roof to intercept her, the gunslingers behind us keep me pinned down. The deep breath, I get to my feet and swipe away the bullets. The first volley, then the second. I mistime the shots and let one slip by. It grazes Lena's ribs. She grabs her side and shoots me a look. With Lena turned around, the gunslinger ahead of us tries to take her out. She shifts her weight and chops at the bullet with the back of her hand. And a moment later, the gunslinger slides from his saddle and tumbles off the side of the cliff into the water below. Then she turns, climbs onto the roof, and makes herself a target for the gunslingers trailing behind us. They take the bait, unloading their guns at her. She sweeps the bullets into the bowl of her arms, letting the momentum of the bullets spin her around before letting them go. The gunslingers and horses collapse behind us in a shower of bullets. When she turns back toward me, it's like I'm invisible. She stares straight through me. Her eyes go big. Put it down, she says, her voice quaking. I turn, and there is the driver with the gun in his hand. But he's not pointing it at us. He's aiming at the front right wheel, the one skirting dangerously close to the side of the cliff. He doesn't say anything. He pulls the trigger. Six quick shots that tear through the spokes and flange. The wheel tears free from the hub. The wagon shudders, and the right corner collapses into the ground, bucking the driver from his seat and over the edge of the cliff, his scream drowned out by the wagon screeching along the trail. The spooked horses won't stop running, but with each passing second, the corner of the heavy wagon digging into the ground takes us closer and closer to the edge of the cliff. Lena clambers over the roof to the driver's seat, takes up the reins and yanks them, trying to stop the horses, but it's no use. I still have the gunslinger shooter. Getting low on the rooftop, I reach the gun down the side of the wagon and blow the heavy lock off the door. The door swings open and a gunslinger looks up at me, hatred etched into her face. She points her gun at me, but before she can pull the trigger, a violent kick from inside the cabin sends her flying over the cliff. Nico pokes his head out. It's about time, he yells. We have to go, Lena shouts from the driver's seat. The horses tear free from the wagon and surge ahead down the path. The left front wheel breaks from the hub and goes bouncing off the cliff. Lena is thrown from the driver's seat, tumbles over the top of the carriage, and falls off the back. Nico gazes at the white water below. I offer him my hand. He takes it and I pull him up. There are only seconds. The wagon starts to spin, the open door shifting away from the cliff edge. One by one, Cass, the man in the cassock, and Daniel leap from the carriage. We have to jump! Nico shouts, before leaping, roughly but safely, to the path below. The wagon grinds to the edge and begins to tip over. Now's my only chance. And then the wagon goes over, and my world turns on its side. At the last moment, I scrabble onto the lip of the wagon roof, get a foot up onto the side, which is now the top, and vault away from the vehicle. For a moment, I feel like I'm floating. And then gravity reasserts itself. I'm not going to make it. I start to fall. Everything slows down. There is no sound. The sun is only a pinprick of light in a black sky. And every few moments, a thump like a drum. And all I can think about is the creature. Can almost hear its small, impossibly loud heartbeat against my chest as if it was still pressed up against me. My last wish is for Nico to take the creature and run, to get as far away from all this fighting and madness as possible, to let the creature grow up to be kind, 
and true, and to never have to go through what its mother went through. And then suddenly I'm not falling. A hand grabs my wrist, which I'd been reaching out desperately for purchase in the thin air. My body swings like a pendulum, and I crash sidelong against the rocky cliff face, feeling my ribs buckle under the impact. A happy pain. The blackness that had crowded my vision recedes, and when I look up at the edge of the cliff, there's Nico holding on to me, his face bloodied from his leap from the carriage. He pulls me over the lip, and for a few moments we lie on our backs on the path. But there's no time to rest. I need to get back to the creature. I try to stand too quickly and buckle at the pain in my ribs. Can you walk? Cass stands over me, scanning the end of the path. The baby. I left it up above. I know where it is, Lena says, jumping on one of the bully catcher's horses and racing down the track. Nico and Cass help me to my feet. We need to move, Cass says. We're not too far from the fort. Once they figure that the wagon ain't showing, they'll send a posse to see what happened. Lena lets out a call from the lip of the cliff above us. She's found the creature. Like a candle going out, all the anxiety and energy in me wanes. The pain in my ribs sends a sharp shiver through my body. Cass lifts my shirt and studies the wound. I don't think they're broken, but that's a bruise that'll go right through you. Nico dusts himself off, takes out his kerchief, and dabs the blood from a gash in his forehead and a split lip. You look like hell, I tell him. Must run in the family. He smiles and hands me the kerchief. No thanks. You got blood on it. He puts it back in his pocket and begins to walk away. I grab his wrist and he stops. Hey, thanks. You know, for saving our lives back there. That's what I'm here for. Cass, Lena, Nico, and the man in the cassock lead the way, heading back in the direction of Half Moon. Daniel lingers behind. I notice that he's one of those people that looks tall because they stand so straight. His hair is neatly cropped, black on top and stark white at the temples. He has a military presence about him. But when he speaks to me, his voice is soft, low, and tobacco-scarred. You must be Emma, he says. Cass has told me a lot about you. I stick out my hand and he takes it. I hope to hell you're worth it. We move quickly off the path and into the trees, farther inland, just as a posse of gunslingers rounds the bend and spots the debris littering the sunken pass. We watch in silence a few moments, before Cass whispers that we best be moving on. Problem is, we only have three horses. The two that Lena and I brought with us, and the one that didn't die or gallop away in the fight. And after what happened today, it's not like we can just amble our way back into Half Moon to collect our things. But Daniel seems unworried. You don't live in one place as long as I've lived in Half Moon without making plenty of enemies or plenty of friends, he says. And I believe I've made the latter. Avoiding the trail, we make our way back to town slowly. I ride atop one of the horses because my ribs make it painful to breathe. Lena leads the other two horses by the reins so I can cradle the creature. When we arrive at the cabin at the top of the path leading down to town... Daniel asks us to stay hidden so he can speak with the caretaker there. That old cuss'll rat you out faster than anyone, Nico says. Jasper's an old friend. Though he's no bullet catcher, he fought in the war on our side. But when we came into town, he made a big deal about how, if he needed to, he'd call on the gunslingers at the drop of a hat. Of course. What if you had been gunslingers sent to root out some anti-gunslinger force? He'd give himself up right away if he were to announce that he'd rather shoot his own foot off than talk to the authorities. But besides that, the war hasn't been around these parts in a long time. Most people have tried to move on with their lives. There was a time when we all thought of the world as divided down the middle, and each person had to be for one side or against it. War makes us think that way, but the world has never been that simple. And then he marches out of the brush, down the path, and when he reaches the cottage, he politely raps on the door. The man inside opens up and invites him in. And not long after that, the old man rides into town, only to return an hour later driving our carriage. Well, that was easy, Cass says. Daniel smiles. 
Everything is made easier by friends and allies. You're listening to Bullet Catcher Season 3 by Joaquin Lowe. Produced by Realm, your portal to another world. Listen away. Bullet Catcher is written by Joaquin Lowe. Produced by Marco Palmieri. And executive produced by Molly Barton. Performed by Inez del Castillo. Audio produced, directed, and designed by Amanda Rose Smith. Additional editing by Corey Barton. Original theme composed by Hashem Asadolahi, with performances by Justin Morell and Josh Deutsch. Cover art by Christine Barcelona. <laughs>